With skin furrowed and worn, these walls are a testament of old age. Each scar is a story, each fold a reminder of years gone by. This is the heart of a legend, an 800-year-old baobab rooted in the untamed savanna of Zimbabwe. It belongs to a prehistoric species born of the earth before man stood tall and the continents divided. Providing food, water, and a sanctuary within its cave, the enormous baobab is one of the most iconic trees in Africa. None has more tales to tell than the tree with the hollow heart. Standing an imposing 82 feet tall, with an equally impressive girth spanning 20 feet, the mighty Baobab towers above the surrounding acacia and Mapani woodland. This is Malelangwe, a place of immense beauty. Life here gathers in great numbers on the plains that surround the Baobab. It's June, the beginning of winter, the dry season in southern Zimbabwe. With little rain to sustain large trees, grasslands dominate the area. These savannas provide ample forage for large herbivores, some of the most nutritious grazing in Africa. With grazers abundant, so are the predators. In winter, the great tree sheds its leaves from its limbs. Its thick, finger-like branches grasp at the open sky. It resembles a gnarled, inverted root system. According to Bushman folklore, the Baobab offended God, and in revenge, God planted the tree upside down, earning the Baobab its nickname, the Upside Down Tree. Gleaning tiny insects from its bark, a variety of colorful birds flocks to the colossal tree. Its jagged, notched skin is the perfect playground for young tree squirrels. They nest in an old, dead tree next to the baobab, but return each day to forage within its treasure-laden folds. This is their territory, and they boldly defend their baobab against rival squirrels. Although winter mornings can be cold, today, the temperature soars to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. The heat sucks the moisture from the earth, creating a sweltering shimmer. Soon water will be in short supply. The baobab adapts to the winter drought by contracting its trunk when it's dry. 
Its vast root system stretches out over 164 feet away to quench its insatiable thirst. Water collected by these roots is stored within the tree's bulging trunk. Over the centuries, animals have realized the merit of this and have gouged out large chunks of its fibrous flesh to extract the sap. It's scarred and deformed. Fortunately, the baobab is one of the few trees that can regenerate its bark, and over time, its wounds heal. Elephants are responsible for most of the scars on the baobab's trunk. Many believe that this behavior is not due to appetite and is more related to social or sexual drives instead, a way to display their strength. But in the dry season, the large herbivores rely heavily on trees to survive when water is scarce. Tearing off the bark reveals a baobab's softer inner layers, which can contain 26,000 gallons of water even during a drought. It's also rich in linoleic acid. Elephants can only obtain this essential fatty acid from plants, which helps with pregnancy and fetal development. Over the past 10 to 12,000 years, roaming elephants have been tearing down acacia forests, turning them into barren scrubland and opening up space for savanna grasslands to flourish. It's a natural process for these giant architects to alter the woodland and change the face of Africa. This is the end result. Entire regions completely cleared of trees. But the elephants are not at fault. Today, their ancient migration routes have been cut off and they are forced to retreat into smaller protected areas. When elephants could wander freely, woodlands had a chance to recover and this was part of the natural cycle of things. What once was acacia woodland will now become a flourishing grassland. In some parts of Africa, even the baobabs fall and must be protected against these giants. This is probably how the great tree's hollow heart became exposed. It was always there, just hidden from view. Older baobabs are all hollow on the inside. A baobab's trunk is actually a collection of stems that grow in a circle and fuse together over hundreds of years, creating a natural cavity. This cave runs an impressive 10 feet across and 36 feet high. Three breeding pairs of white-backed vultures have chosen to make the baobab their home. Large trees provide the perfect refuge for their nests. But with the trees threatened, so is their habitat. These vultures rarely leave their established range and will remain faithful to its branches year-round. August is breeding season for the colony, 
and it's time to repair last season's nest. With an adult wingspan of more than seven feet, the nests are substantial. On one of the baobab's thickest branches, the birds build a sturdy platform of sticks lined with grass and green leaves. Their partnership is monogamous, and both parents incubate a single egg for almost two months. The tree provides a much needed refuge for the chicks to hatch. For now, in their baobab fortress, they're safe. By midday, the sun's rays penetrate the baobab's cave. Here, a nest of a different kind is anchored to the cave's wall. Ropalidia wasps. Their comb-like dwelling is exposed to direct sunlight, making its larval residence hot. The adults beat their wings to fan the brood. With spring around the corner, today it's a sweltering 90 degrees Fahrenheit. A Ropalidia wasp is tiny, less than half an inch long. It can be distinguished from other wasps by its swollen abdomen, into which the remaining segments are telescoped. The wasps use their venom as an alarm pheromone. Pumping the abdomen spreads the venom into the air to warn the colony against intruders. When living in a colony, there's always the danger of diseases spreading amongst the horde. So the wasps groom to remove debris and parasites. But it's not just to stay clean. Grooming spreads chemical cues over the body. These secretions are a vital form of communication. The wasps inspect each other with their antennae, transferring information. So their language is a rather intimate affair. Spring yields little change in the land. It holds its breath until the first rain arrives. High in the baobab's crown, bulky communal nests appear, like great tufts of tangled hair. They belong to one of the animal kingdom's noisiest birds. A male, red-billed buffalo weaver. His unnerving babble fills the September morning air. It's to defend his quarters. And he has a lot to defend. Male buffalo weavers are polygamous, each in charge of up to three females and eight nesting chambers. And it's his job to build the nest. He clumsily bounces around the untidy structure to pluck and shove thorny twigs into his lair. The sharper the thorns, the more protected the nest is against predators like snakes. The nests are invariably infested with fleas and mites, and the weavers must groom regularly to get rid of these pests. He's got a full-time job to keep his harem in check. 
He divides the ever-growing mass of sticks into several lodges with multiple egg chambers for each female. On a clear night in the savannah, a nightjar sings to the immeasurable vastness of the universe. Hidden in the dark recesses of the Baobab's cave, a pair of black eyes misses nothing. A barn owl searching for a tasty tidbit. Below, the grisly remains of its nightly exploits. Bones of rodents, hares and beetles litter the cave's floor. Dawn races like fire across the savannah. The hot temperature manifests change in the mighty baobab. Young leaves sprout from the tree's branches. The leaves branch out into five to seven leaflets resembling fingers. With the leaves, the baobab's first flowers appear. The new foliage softens its harsh lines and gnarled body. Spring is the driest time of the year. The land is completely devoid of water. The savannah craves rain. Making the best of the heat, an African striped skink warms up in a crack on the baobab's trunk. The tree is the perfect hunting ground for the lizard. The elephant damage on the baobab provides plenty of nooks and crannies in which to hide and hunt. As a frequent item on the menu of others, the skink has wide set eyes on either side of its head, giving it a broad range of vision to watch out for predators. But as a hunter itself, it needs accurate depth perception, better achieved with the forward-facing binocular eyes of a predator. So it wiggles its head from side to side to determine how far away its next meal is. It has a transparent window in its lower eyelid, called a reptilian spectacle. This protects the skink's eyes against the elements, while allowing it to look out for predators, even when its eyes are closed. A snake-eyed skink also resides in the baobab's crevices. A mere two and a half inches long, it's three times smaller than its striped cousin. 
it slithers across the ground, much as a snake would, joining the ticks and beetles also foraging in the mulch on the cave's floor. The striped skink watches hungrily as its snake-eyed cousin gulps up termites from amongst the leaf litter. It's too easy a target to ignore. While the snake-eyed tail still twitches, the striped skink swallows the rest of its body whole. As spring draws to a close, clouds gather in the heavens around the tree with a hollow heart. The moisture in the air makes for hot, humid October days in the savannah. The billows bring with them summer's first rain. Life embraces the gloom. A jumping spider drinks water droplets that have accumulated on its back during the rain. The weather makes the squirrels lazy. They've been evicted from their den in the dead tree close to the baobab by a family of lesser bush babies. These primates live close to the baobab so they can drink nectar from the tree's flowers. The rain provokes a fresh flourish of leaves and flowers that hang from the upside down tree's branches. The baobab has finally shared its stark winter persona. Large round buds covered with soft velvety hairs decorate the tree. As the sun sets, the buds begin to open. Each flower blooms for just one night, then withers and dies the next day. Although it's believed that bats pollinate the baobab's blossoms at night, in southern Africa, there's no record of this. It's still unclear what the tree's primary pollinators are in Zimbabwe. In the morning, insects are seduced by the flower's sickly sweet scent. The ball of stamen at the center of the bloom is the male part of the plant. 
the white tuft protruding from these bristles is the female stigma. Mapani and African honeybees frantically search for nectar amongst the bristles, all the while collecting pollen, the male gamete. They fly to another flower's female stigma, and with their precious cargo still on board, they pollinate it. But while the honeybees serve the baobab, the tree also serves them with more than just nectar. One of the baobab's hollow limbs makes the perfect home for their hive. A good-sized colony like this one can contain up to 50,000 bees. These are all worker bees sterile females that maintain the hive, gather pollen and feed their queen. The bees require a large diversity of pollen and nectar from different plants to stay healthy. Workers carry the pollen back to the hive in pollen baskets on their legs while transporting nectar in a second stomach. The bees then chew the pollen for about half an hour before placing it in the hexagonal cells where it will turn into honey. For years, this hive has had a symbiotic alliance with the baobab. One depends on the other. The burst of new foliage on the baobab's branches causes an invasion of another kind. Moths and butterflies often lay their eggs in baobab trees. When the eggs hatch in summer, their caterpillars feast on the tree's tender leaves. The larvae, in turn, lure insect-eating birds to the baobab. Red-headed weavers bounce around the tree's branches in search of fat grubs. The weavers are so enamored with the tree that they build their nests in its branches. A fork-tailed drongo and its mate also breed in the tree. Their nest is made of twigs and tendrils strongly bound together with strands of spider silk. Inside the baobab's hollow heart, the Ropalidia wasp colony is expanding. Their larvae have hatched, and female workers diligently nurse the brood. These worker wasps hunt the caterpillars on the baobab's branches and bring their quarry back to the nest. They devour the caterpillars, then regurgitate and feed them to the larvae. If one of their youngsters dies, the wasps make a meal of it. Larval cannibalism isn't unusual in social wasps and is the result of reproductive competition in the nest. This happens when there's more than one egg-laying queen in the colony. Larvae that survive 
eventually seal themselves in their cells with caps of silk before metamorphosing into adult wasps. At the end of November, the last of the baobab's flowers cling to the tree. The brown petals, now shriveled and dry, emit a strong, rotting odor. Summer's early bounty lies scattered in the dirt. Months later, the savannah has transformed into a lavish Eden. It's February, the apex of a humid, wet summer in Malilangwe, and the morning quickly heats up. An ocean of greenery surrounds the baobab, and the great tree's limbs are covered in a shroud of leaves. The buffalo weavers are still trying to perfect their ever-evolving nests. But now they have a team of young helpers, this year's brood. These fledglings have brown plumage. They assist their mothers by adding softer materials like grass and leaves to the nesting chambers. But the immature birds often get confused which nest is theirs. And resident males chase them off when they knock on the wrong door. Buffalo weavers are the only birds that have a penis-like organ. Both male and female weavers have this appendage, but only the male can reach orgasm another unique feature amongst birds. And in this case, size does matter, because females prefer the male with the biggest tool. There's an explosion of life in Malalangwe. In these summer months, there's no shortage of water. Spoonbills and plovers seize the moment and sift through the muck for a frog or a worm. And seasonal wetlands adorn the savannah. It's where giants roam. Elephants gather at water holes to enjoy the bounty of the wet season. There's so much water on the grass plains of the savannah now that these thirsty travelers leave the baobab alone. In this time of plenty, the baobab drinks its fill from the earth, swelling its pot-bellied mass in preparation for leaner seasons. By March, young fruits replace the baobab's flowers to dangle from its limbs. These lime green capsules look like giant velvety eggs and have a hard shell that's difficult to crack. The fuzzy fruit will take three months to mature. With the elephant's thirst quenched, 
The Baobab scars now have time to heal. But the tree's fresh wounds attract smaller scavengers. Cotton stainer bugs gather in these damaged recesses, using sucking mouthparts to pierce the baobab's fibrous wood. They drink the tree's sap. Young stainer nymphs are bright red, and they're found all over the tree at different stages of development. As they grow, the nymphs go through five transformations and begin to develop wings. Their pattern slowly evolves and their vibrant color fades. The final metamorphosis brings with it subdued tones of brown crossed with pale yellow lines. Where cotton stainers live, one sure to find their greatest adversary, the cotton stainer assassin bug. It's no coincidence they look similar. This adult assassin bug feeds exclusively on cotton stainers and mimics its prey's coloration. It slowly approaches its target, which mistakes it for a large compatriot. Using its sharp beak-like mouthpart, this young assassin injects its prey with saliva. The deadly liquid contains enzymes which paralyze the victim and liquefy its tissues from within. It sucks out the digested fluids, completely draining its quarry. Only a desiccated skeleton remains. Another opportunistic predator waits at the bottom of the baobab. A guttural toad will eat just about anything that scurries past. Regrettably, cotton stainers taste dreadful. In the brush underneath the baobab's branches, an orb weaver gracefully scales her web. As her name suggests, the golden orb web spider silk is yellow. With a body more than an inch long and a leg span of five inches, the banded legged golden orb web spider is a formidable huntress. In sunlight, the golden threads lure bees into her trap. In shadow, they become camouflaged amongst the green foliage and the web ensnares other unsuspecting insects. Their remains are strung up on her web. Small, crude packages tied up with yellow string. Her silk is incredibly strong. It's so durable that she can snare small birds like this blue wax bill in her web. Her drag line strand is several times stronger than steel on a weight to weight basis. But she's not the only spider beneath the great tree. A black legged golden orb web spider identifiable by the windows on her abdomen resembling a skull, 
has also made her home in the shade of the baobab. She clings to her web with tiny claws at the end of her legs. By gently pulling each leg through her mouth, she scrapes off bits of silk and debris so she won't become entangled in her own trap. Close by, a male orb web spider looks on patiently. He is one thousandth of her weight. Every day he consumes his web and recycles the protein into the next day's creation. The male seeks to mate with this colossal temptress. But females often eat their partners after mating, so he cautiously waits for her to be otherwise occupied. He sees the perfect opportunity. While she's feeding, he makes his move. But his plan is transparent. And she's not in the mood. By April, the Baobab's canopy is a fiery altar of oranges and yellows. Autumn is by far the most vibrant season in Malalangwe, as trees begin to shed their leaves. The baobab's eight-inch long pods are now mature. Their brown woody shells are even harder than before. Some of these fruits fall to the ground and crack open, revealing their hidden riches. The flesh inside is a sour, chalky pulp. One of the most nutrient-dense superfruits in the world, it may well be the richest plant-based source of calcium, three and a half times more potent than milk. It also contains twice as much magnesium than leafy vegetables and 10 times the vitamin C of an orange. Peeking out from within this wholesome mealy pulp, the baobab seeds. Fighting for a spot to suck out their sap, the cotton stainer bugs can't get enough of these seeds. During this gluttonous battle, the bugs spoil the seeds and seal the fate of the baobab saplings. The fallen fruit has an unexpected visitor, a jumping spider. These spiders round off their insect diet with plant products like pollen, nectar, and grains of baobab fruit. When it comes to the elephants, fruit goes in one end, woody skin and all, and the seeds come out the other, complete with their own handy pile of nutrient-rich fertilizer. Ants and termites devour that which is not eaten by the larger animals. Hollowed out pods are perfect nesting sites for the termites. And the ants prey on their young. By the end of autumn, all that remains are empty shells.
For 800 years, this enormous baobab has stood the test of time, harboring those that would seek shelter amongst its branches and feeding others that wander through. Sadly, it is part of a dying breed. Few young trees now survive to such maturity. As farmland encroaches, livestock gorge on its tender shoots. There are virtually no more young baobabs in the savanna to take the place of their elders. As these titans die out, vulture numbers also plummet. The number of white-backed vultures has decreased significantly in the last decade. In just 10 years, their conservation status has gone from least concern to critically endangered due to habitat loss. If this continues, whitebacks will be extinct in 20 years. The mammoth baobab plays an important role for the future of these incredible birds and for all of Malilangwe. animal to the smallest insect. The mighty baobab bewitches all. With luck, the tree with the hollow heart will be around for centuries more.